Good evening, my name is Josh and I'm an alcoholic. Uh, before I get started, could we please have a moment of silence for Jamie Hood? Thank you. Uh, so again, my name is Josh and I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Josh. Um, and today, through God dependence and service to others, you know, I'm happy to stand up here in front of you and hopefully share some experience, strength, and hope. Describe to you in a general way what it was like, what happened, and what it's like today. Um, I have a sponsor. He knows he's my sponsor. Um, he knows he's my sponsor because I call him and harass him every single day. Every time of the day, every time of night, he can always expect a phone call from me. If not, he can expect a self-centered text when he wakes up. Um, <laughs> you know, and... Like, honestly, I have to do that. I have to continuously talk because for too many years I didn't talk. I didn't let any of it out and I kept it all in. And uh, as long as I was keeping everything in, I was keeping myself sick. And as long as I was keeping myself sick, I was looking for an escape through any means necessary. Um, I don't know, like, how tonight's going to go. Hopefully I show up as the pipe and not the well. Um, you know, so if I'm rambling around in circles and it's making no sense, it's because I can tell my ego's starting to show up and I'm trying to get myself lost and confused so that God can show up. Um, so, I guess I'll just kind of start at the beginning and we'll see where we end up and how the night goes, right? Um, so I grew up in the small town of Durango, Colorado. Um, if anybody's seen South Park, that's really kind of encapsulates it all. Um, you know, it was a, a small little college drinking town and, uh, you know, one of my earliest memories, and I've heard, like, a lot of people use this analogy, is like, growing up, I always felt like I was wearing this itchy sweater. You know, every single place I walked into, I felt uncomfortable in my own skin. I didn't quite know where I belonged. And uh, I'd show up and walk into conversations, and I'd always feel like I was three seconds late to the conversation. Um, or I'd walk into a room, and, you know, people would, like, glance over at me, and all of a sudden, they were glancing over at me, which means they were talking about me two seconds before they walked in the room. And if they were talking to me, it had to be bad, and I just had to know what they were saying because I just needed to be okay. And I needed to be okay by just showing up as the person that they wanted me to be. So I needed to know what they were saying because I was terrified. Just terrified that I wasn't going to be okay, that I wasn't going to fit in, that I wasn't going to be enough. And because of all of that, that I was going to be alone. And if I was alone, I was going to fucking die. And um, that fear coursed through my veins. Like I wouldn't put on my shoes in the morning if it wasn't for fear of stepping on rocks. And um, still today, you know, like fear continuously crops up. Um, and just like the book says, you know, driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity, you know, like step on the toes of my fellows and they retaliate. And that was a common theme through my life and I just couldn't see it. Um, you know, like I picked up the drink mentally long before I picked up Please the drink uh, with that fear being so ingrained. Like I was always dishonest. I always like joked that the only thing I ever learned how to use in moderation was honesty. Um, because... <laughs> I'd be honest when it served me, I'd be dishonest all the time because, you know, I wanted to be dishonest because I needed the acceptance, I needed to fit in, and I just didn't know what that was like. And I remember at uh, nine years old, uh, my sister passed. She was at a party. She had just got accepted to Colorado State University. She was celebrating that, and uh, she fell off the third floor balcony and was in a coma. And uh, I was in the hospital, and it was the first conversation I really had with God. And I remember saying, like, God, just not Sharon, please not Sharon. Um, and of course she passed two days later. And, uh, you know, at that point, I re I, in my mind, how it was is that God was not gonna be there for me. I had to do this on my own and that was okay. I didn't have a conversation with him for almost 20 years later. Uh, and, I mean, less than 20, I can't do math off the top of my head, I'm not. <laughs> I'm definitely not 29, only 26, but, um, so, um, I picked up my first drink when I was 13 years old, and, you know, everyone talks about that sigh of relief that comes with the first drink, but I, being full of fear, thought I had just drinking poison because it was, uh, Smirnoff vodka, and it tasted like rubbing alcohol, and I thought I, I had poisoned myself at 13 years old in my mom's kitchen. And, uh, you know, so being full of fear, I, I, I call poison control. <laughs> and, uh, I'm like, what is this? And they're like, you're an idiot, and hang up the phone. So I'm like, okay. 
I can keep drinking this then, that's fine. Um, and uh, after a few drinks, I started to get that sigh of relief. And all of a sudden, that itchy sweater is gone, you know? It was as if for 13 years, I'd been holding my breath underwater and finally I had an oxygen mask. You know, I could just finally breathe. It was just like, it strapped onto my face and I was just, I was okay. I finally felt okay. Not only did I feel okay, I felt fucking great. I thought I was the man and I called the hottest girl in eighth grade and started talking to her and uh, you know, she was laughing and she thought I was funny and you know, I didn't really love what alcohol did to me. I felt a little sick, a little dizzy, but I loved what alcohol did for me. And, uh, you know, it finally took that itchy sweater off and gave me an oxygen mask. And from that point, all bets were off. I was going to do absolutely anything and everything I needed to do to get that first drink. Now, 13 years old, I'm not being able to walk into a liquor store and, you know, just get what I need. I mean, I still have a baby face. I still get ID'd for cigarettes most days. And, um, you know, so I did it when I could. And every time I did, I did it to get drunk. There was no middle ground. It was just find oblivion. And, um because I love that feeling. I love that feeling more than anything. And, um, you know, it escalated quickly to the point where 14 years old, so just like less than a year later, it was a few months, um, you know, anything standing in between me and a drink was a problem. And, you know, I remember like, I ran away from home because I was 14 years old and I knew what I was gonna do with my life and uh, had all the answers and had everything figured out. My mom found out where I was staying and she goes by that place and she, you know, grabs the money from my friend's dad. Uh, you know, he pointed her to where my stuff was and she grabbed the money and grabbed my alcohol and I was livid. And I walked over to her house and held her up at knife point to get what I needed because nothing's gonna stand in between me and my solution. You know, the, li the book says that line, pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. Like I love my mother to death. You know, but still, if you come between me and that drink, I am sorry, but I'm going to do whatever I have to. Um, you know, all those yets, all those nevers continuously came true, and that was one of them. Like, I would never put hands on my mother, and here I am. You know, and um, so 14 years old, I have a felony. And, uh, you know, I feel like the whole world's against me, and I'm fucked. You know, and this, this starts to become the common thought process that I have in all my affairs, is everyone's against me, and I'm fucked. Um, and like that there's no way out there's no hope whatever um so during this time i like transferred to the only other high school in my hometown there's two schools and apparently like at the first one it wasn't okay if you showed up and sold drugs at school they didn't like that so i decided maybe the other high school would um <laughs> and it was like third day in this high school and I'm walking in and I'm full of fear, right? It's a new environment. I have no idea what to do with myself. I'm on probation so I don't have my solution. And what that looks like for me when I don't have my solution and I'm full of fear is I'm irritable, restless, and discontent continuously. Irritable is in like I'm just pissed the fuck off all the time everywhere I go um, and I'm going to let people see that. Uh, you know, restless is just that same feeling that is you sweater, not being comfortable in my own skin, needing to continuously get out of it. And like discontent is like not satisfied with anything. Like it must be the school, so let me switch the school. Like this girl wasn't doing it, so maybe if she gave me attention, I'd feel okay. You know, maybe if I had just lived here, maybe if anything else, anything else but where I am and who I'm at and what I'm doing could just make me feel okay. And um, you know, pretty soon, like at that school, I'm just getting into fights all the time, get expelled and um, end up in a wilderness rehab in Oregon. And, uh, <laughs> You know, so I'm in the middle of the woods all the way from home and, you know, it was good. It was kind of that like reprieve, right? Like, like the book says, you know, once we, once we put it down, that mental fog starts to lift, you know, like put the plug in the jug and I can kind of start to see things a little more clearly. And I'm hearing all the good rehab talk and I've got it. Like I have all the answers. I know what I'm going to do and I got my plan of action and I know my triggers. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I come out and I go to this boarding school and I celebrate my six months sober by getting incredibly obliterated um, because, you know, that's really all I know how to do at the end of the day. You know, there's continuously that moment where nothing stands in between me and a drink except me and I'm fucked. And, um, you know, thank God there's the solution for that today. Like, thank God that at those moments, the thing standing in between me and a drink is God, as long as I continue to keep him close, you know. Faith has to work in me and through me 24 hours a day or I perish. And, um, 
You know, that means that yesterday sobriety isn't going to work for me today. I can backlog seven meetings this week, but if I'm not in one today, like I know I'm in trouble. You know, there's three things I continuously do on a daily basis. Talk to another alcoholic, pray, and look for opportunities to be of service. And if I can't find an opportunity, I pray until one shows up. And, um, you know, because of that, that's why I'm alive today, really. Um, so, back to the story, back to all of that. Uh, basically, like, the next few years, it's kind of went rinse, wash, repeat. Like, um, you know, there... I end up getting kicked out of the boarding school I was at because, again, you know, they don't like people selling drugs or doing drugs on their campus. That didn't really go with my MO. Um, and I remember, like, you know, they, like, my parents had begged for me to be able to go back and they set up a deal. They're like, you know what, if he can just be good for just three weeks, you know, and have a clean piss test, just three weeks, that's it, you know, just. And I remember my dad typed up this contract of, like, things I needed to do. And, like, one of them was, like, not get high or drink. And, uh, you know, you could have strapped me up to a polygraph when I signed that thing because I was going to do it. I had full <laughs> intentions of sticking to that. And um, I remember two weeks pass and I'm white knuckling it. You know, that irritable, restless discontent is there. That fear is there. That continual fear of the unknown, fear of the future, fear of myself, fear of being alone. And, um, I'm white knuckling it two weeks and I'm like, okay, you just got a week left, a week left, you know, seven days, seven days, six days passes, five days passes, four days, four days, you can make it just four days, three days, I'm picking up. And, uh, you know, that morning, I remember like trying to leave my father's house and him standing in the way between me and what I needed. And of course, what do I do? I'm going to do absolutely anything I need to. And like, Again, my dad, my best friend, you know, my rock, my support, I lay hands on him because he's standing in between me and a drink. And, um, you know, a few days later was my 17th birthday, and uh, my mom convinces me to come home, and I, I think her line was do laundry or get cake or something like that. Enough to, you know, convince me being white kid homeless that, um, <laughs> that you know, that's, that's what I needed to do. And uh, so I go over there, and I'm sitting there, I'm fucked up out of my mind and it's like midnight and I'm just sitting in my room and you know the thought crosses my mind that you're about to get sent back to rehab <laughs> and like on cue two transporters walk into the room and I'm going back to rehab um, so like basically just like a fast forward of what it looked like over the next year of my life was hopping between different treatment centers um, you know there was one uh, that was more of like a money trap you know, parents would get therapy notes from a counselor that I never saw about progress that I wasn't making when really what I was doing was breaking into the med room and getting anything I could get my hands on or huffing gas out of a lawnmower just to escape myself or huffing cans of Axe, you know, anything I could. And I remember during that time when I was in that rehab, I was trying to save up enough pills to kill myself. And I was getting so fucking mad because it's like, as much as I was trying to save them up, I kept using them to get high. And like, I couldn't understand like, why I couldn't just save up enough to end it. But like, I needed my solution. I needed to continuously get out of myself and feel, not feel the way I was feeling, you know? And um, so that program got shut down by Child Protective Services and I get bumped to another program. And so here I am coming up on 18 years old and I'm just like, you know what, fuck it. You know, like my sister died at the age of 19. Like, I think that's where I belong. I think that's where I'm gonna go. My dad calls me and he says, uh, you know what, Josh, I sat back and lost one kid and I'm not going to sit back and lose another. And he hangs up the phone. And like, that was that moment for me where I was like, okay, this is real. Let's do something about it. And uh, I signed the paperwork to stay after turning 18 because I wanted to complete the program. And I went to my first AA meeting. And uh, I was in rehab in St. George, Utah. And I go to my first AA meeting. And uh, I walk in and it's just a whole bunch of old people. And, uh, you know, I heard one of my friends refer to it as, like, Alcoholics Anonymous for retired people, AARP. And, um, <laughs> like, you know, I'm hearing all these stories, right? I'm just hearing all the stories, and I'm like, I haven't done that yet, you know? Disregard the fact that I've held my mom up at knife point. I haven't had a DUI. Disregard the fact that I beat the shit out of my dad to get out the front door and get a drink because, like, I haven't lost a marriage, you know? Like... And so I qualify myself out as soon as I walk myself in. And um, 
But the one thing that stuck with me is I remember they were happy. And I couldn't figure that out because you take away my best friend, my solution, and I just want to kill everybody. Like, I just want to burn every building down that's in front of me. And, uh, like, I'm just absolutely miserable. And, you know, but I get out of rehab and I do the things that they tell me to do. I keep that trigger packet close and, um, you know, like, <laughs> think that that's going to save me, you know. Because, again, I think that self-knowledge is going to be enough. I think that if I just know enough about this disease, that it won't come back and bite me in the ass. You know, that I can just think it away, that I can will it away, and that I'll be okay. Because I hadn't conceded to my innermost self that I was absolutely powerless and that my, mind, that my life was unmanageable. And um, so, basically, I get out of rehab and I'm white-knuckling it. Um, I do the things they tell me to do. I go to an AA meeting and I get a sponsor. I can't tell you that guy's name. I never called him again. And, like, they said 90 and 90. That didn't fit my schedule. I was going to do what I wanted to do. Um, and then a couple days after rehab, I met my first hostage. Um, and so I met a girl, and she became my god. Uh, and that was it for me. Like, I was set. I had everything I needed. I had a job. I had a girl. I was good. I was good, you know? And, like, why come into a 12-step fellowship and find God when I got her? She's my god, you know? I can stay sober for her. And, um, you know, like... Humans are finite, man. Like, I can't make my higher power another human being because they're going to fail me. And, like, you know, driven by that fear, like, what that looks like is I stick my hands into the relationship and try to control every single facet of it because how dare my fucking solution walk out that door? You know, how dare you leave me when I need you? And, um, you know, so quickly my hostage leaves. At this point, I had moved up to Denver with her, and uh, I throw myself into AA, you know. Because, like, I didn't know what else to do at this point. You know, I'm dropping out of college. It was my first semester. I'm dropping out. I think I'm going to join the military. The military won't take me because they say I'm pretty much equivalent of a high school dropout with no GED. And um, so, like, I throw myself into, into AA and start going through it, go through steps one, two, and three. Not through three. I stop at three. Because I remember standing in this parking lot and some guy started talking to me about God and I flashed back to the hospital room with my sister and I said, fuck your God, and I walked away. And um, so I started looking for another solution, find another hostage, rinse, wash, repeat through the next five years, you know, and I'm just white knuckling it continuously trying this. And like every single time what it would look like is like I'd be in a relationship, I'd be good, relationship would end, I'd be miserable, I'd start trying AA again, I'd get choked up on one of the steps and I'd turn and walk away and go back to what I thought I knew. Because anything was better than me drinking or drugging, right? Like, I can sit here and be sick as shit and a dry drunk and cause all these harms, but that's better, right? And um, I remember uh, after college had ended, I graduated college, the girlfriend left me and I lost the job. You know, my three programs of recovery came to a sudden and abrupt halt, and I had checked myself out of AA fully, um, and uh, instantly that thing was on me. That thing was riding on my back, and uh, I felt I couldn't talk about it, right? Like, during college, like, I'd been asked by a professor to do motivational speeches about being sober. Like, I'd become this, like, poster boy for sobriety when I didn't even know what fucking sobriety was. And, um, so... <laughs> Like, I'm sitting there, and I'm like, I can't talk to anybody about this. Like, I don't even know who to talk to. I don't have any fellowship. I don't have anything. Like, all I can do is just white-knuckle it, hold on, and hope I'm going to be okay. But, like, that seed was planted. And I remember the next few months was absolute hell because of all that guilt and shame of, like, I'm supposed to be, like, Mr. Sobriety. Like, I'm supposed to show up in some sort of way. And, like, I don't even know what that looks like anymore because all I want to do is either drink or blow my brains out. And, um... My best friend, who actually made it down to the meeting tonight, uh, I was on the phone with him, and I remember he called me, and we were talking, and I was in it. That thing was on my back, and I was in tears, and I told him I relapsed. And when I told him that, I was still two blocks from the bar. You know, I hadn't even walked in yet. But the decision was made, and there was no going back. You know, once that decision was made, there was absolutely nothing that was going to stand between me and that drink. Um, even though I didn't want to. I had no choice. I had lost the power of choice. And, um, you know, that's this disease, man. Cunning, baffling, powerful. 
And uh, so I spent the next seven months in and out of the doors of AA in a brutal relapse because I knew that AA worked. I'd seen it work. I'd seen it work for people that I'd brought into the rooms even. And um, I knew there was a solution here and I kept trying to tap into it, but I just kept selling myself short. I kept walking out the doors five minutes before the miracle fucking happened because like my pride and my ego kept me sick. Um, you know, I wouldn't ask for help. I wouldn't talk to people. I still thought I had all the answers and I could do it my way. And Josh was going to work. Josh, Josh is anonymous and he was going to be just fine. Thanks. Have a nice day, AA. And um, so finally, like, after months of this hell, after months of this chaos and insanity, I'm sitting in the driveway of my dad's house and the thought hits me. Like, dude, you've caused more harm as a dry drunk than you ever did in active addiction. Like, you've hurt more people, you've fucked up more shit, you've been more selfish, self-centered, and dishonest than you ever were with a bottle in your hand. But you know at this point you can't live with it and you can't live without it, so what's your solution? Kill yourself. And, um, you know, I had been prescribed a bottle of benzos because anxiety, i.e. untreated <laughs> alcoholism. And, um, you know, I grab it all and I swallow it and I lay it down to go to bed. And, uh, I woke up in a hospital. And when I woke up, I was pissed. I was just fucking pissed because my will was to be dead. That was it. That's all I wanted. That was my will. And like at that moment, I had to concede to my innermost self that there was something greater than me at play and I hated him for it. You know, but this, this meant that I could no longer deny the idea of God. Um, didn't have to like it, and I didn't. And I wasn't going to anytime soon. But I couldn't deny that he was there. And, um, you know, so this thing's on me still, you know, and uh, I decide what's going to work if I change my people, places, things, right? I'd been accepted to graduate school at University of Delaware, so maybe if I move 2,500 miles away from my home and take my hostage with me, I'll be okay. And so I pack up my U-Haul and head out here and, um, you know, like, that's what I was going to do. I was going to be okay. And I throw myself into graduate school and like, that's going to be my solution. It worked before, right? I throw myself into work because that worked before, right? I throw myself into the relationship because that worked before, right? And every single day I wake up wanting to put my brains on the ceiling and I can't figure out why. I can't figure out why. Why, after everything I've seen, after everything I've done, the thought of a drink still sounds so fucking good. And, um... You know, it finally reached that point, like hostage left and I'm just miserable and I want to kill myself and I reached out and I asked for help. And, um, you know, I went and I met the man who became my first sponsor out here and he threw me deep into the fellowship. And, uh, you know, he gave me this homework assignment of, you know, talk to other men, get their numbers and continues to hit these meetings, this meeting, that meeting, that meeting, this meeting, like always. And, uh, you know, I, I, I just said yes. I just said yes, because at that point, like, I was so fucking broken. You could have told me to slam my face through a window to find relief, and I would have done it. Because, like, anything was better than putting my brain on the ceiling. But after some time, like, I went to, I went to the Green Hill Friday night, and I heard this speaker. And he was talking. And it was the first time in the rooms of AA that I had really related, you know. His story was completely different from mine, like... Everything about us was entirely different in my mind, but he thought the way I thought, he felt the way I felt, he believed the way I believed, he drank the way I drank. But there was this light on and he was happy. And I could not wrap my head around that. I was like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, no, we're supposed to be like miserable sitting here saying how we want to kill ourselves, right? And like, he was happy. And um, so I worked up the courage to ask him on the like, best date of my life <laughs> uh, and um, you know anybody who's scared of approaching a sponsor or asking them you know to take you through the steps like they're gonna say yes so <laughs> just do it <laughs> you're gonna be okay and um, you never know what's gonna happen you never know how God's gonna put people into your life right exactly when you need them how you need them without any of your little plans or designs because that wasn't my plan that was my design and um, I'm sitting with him before this meeting one night on the Dunkin' Donuts in, on Main Street. 
and uh, I get there a little before him and I order coffee and I'm sitting there and I'm shaking. I can't even hold the coffee fucking upright because like I was going to kill myself that night. And uh, he comes in and we start talking and he's like, so he's like, basically what it sounds like is you haven't actually worked the 12 steps of the 12 step fellowship. Um, and he was right. You know, I hadn't done a moral inventory like my fourth step when I the one time I tried to do it was me using it as a tool to convince somebody to feel sorry for me and uh, left out probably 75% of the shit I'd done um, and my amends there weren't any because like I was still right like everyone had hurt me more than I had hurt them and like <laughs> what do I have to amend there sorry it's you know it was just always poor me like I lived in that self-pity and um, so I'm sitting there and he's talking to me and all of a sudden like I'm just realizing like there is a way out you know there is a solution if I actually do this thing like maybe it'll work maybe it wouldn't who the fuck knew but maybe I was just going to try and see I figured I'd stick around just through these stupid few 12 steps and see what the other side was like and if it didn't work then I could kill myself then I'd be okay you know it'd be my free pass and um because then I would have tried absolutely everything, right? And so I dive in with the desperation of a drowning man. You know, anything he told me to do, any suggestion he gave, I just simply said yes. I simply said yes. And the reason I said yes was because all my best ideas hadn't fucking worked. Everything I thought I knew, everything I thought I thought I knew, you know, couldn't make me love the person that was standing in the mirror every morning couldn't make me feel okay inside and couldn't make me not think of picking up, you know? And, um, you know, so I just realized that my best ideas hadn't worked, my best thinking hadn't worked, and maybe, just maybe, I should shut the fuck up and listen to somebody else, because I love to run my mouth. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, thankfully I met a sponsor who talks more than I do, so. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and so, you know, I start doing this thing and, you know, I just, I just dive in and I start just doing everything that, that I'm, I'm told. I start praying when I don't want to pray to a God that I don't believe in. Um, cause I still didn't believe in God, you know? And like, I remember like sitting there with him and I was like, I don't know if I can do this third step because like, I don't believe in God. He's like, it doesn't say, like, came to believe in God. It's like, are, are you willing to believe? And I was like, uh -huh, I, I guess so. <laughs> like, and literally, that little mustard seed of willingness was all it took. You know, he's like, okay, good, get to work. Here's your inventory, fill it out. And, um, you know, and I kept following, like, when the book says pray, I prayed. You know, the repetition of hitting my knees in the morning when I didn't want to, and at night when I didn't want to, talking in a language I didn't understand to a God that I didn't know, and none of it made fucking sense, but I just kept doing it. And um, something started to happen. I can't really explain it, but something started to happen. I started to look at things differently, and I hated it. Because, <laughs> like, all of a sudden I started getting this, like, weird moral compass where, like, I was feeling bad about, like, all the girls I was sleeping with to fill that void in my soul. I was feeling bad about the new things I was buying to try to make my ego feel a little bit better. I was feeling bad about the way I was treating those I cared about. I was feeling bad that when my mom called me, I would silence the phone. And, um, you know, at that point, I was on my fourth step, and I started to just see my side of the street. For the first time, I was able to see that like every resentment I had held, every finger I had pointed, there was four pointing back at me. And those four usually look like self-centered, selfish, dishonest, and inconsiderate. And, um, you know, like those defects of character were so glaring, I couldn't overlook it. And I remember sitting there at the end of my fifth step with my sponsor with that huge sigh of relief of finally getting everything out that I had carried for all these years just out. And... Um, you know, the most beautiful part was like, yeah, I'd done some grimy shit. I'd done some grimy shit that I hadn't wanted to face. 
but like the beautiful part was is that you know all of that I saw my part and in seeing my part maybe then I could start to do something different you know we always say that cliche like I don't have to live that way anymore but that was the first time it really stuck out in my mind of like you don't have to live this way anymore you know but no human power can relieve me of my alcoholism how can I expect my human power to relieve me of all my defects of character and so I quickly jumped into six and seven and I started looking at all all that shit as it continued to crop up in my life, you know? Like, even after going through a fifth step, I was still trying to live dirty in recovery. You know, I was still, like, lying and manipulating to the girl to make me feel better, you know? And, like, still, like, motives completely off track, but all of a sudden I'm starting to feel those spiritual consequences. Like, I'm like, ooh, this isn't right. And, um, you know, I... I, got, I started to get excited to get up to my amends because I could see some of the behavior changing and I wanted to make it right for them. You know, I started to take myself out of it and see like that I could show up and make these amends and try to repair the wreckage of my past. Um, and like God presented an opportunity for me to fly out to Colorado uh, for a friend's engagement and I instantly seized that opportunity and flew out there because I knew this was like one of the few shots I'd have to make as many amends as possible. And I'm driving to the airport. It's like four in the morning and uh, I'm driving down 95 and I pull over because I'm going to turn around. I'm just terrified. There's no way I'm going to do this. There's no way I'm going to go back and see like everybody who have completely fucked over and cleaned this up because I can't do it. I just can't do it like full of fear and I just start to pray. And in the middle of praying, I start driving. And by the end of praying, I'm at the airport. And like, I just knew, like, that's what I had to do. You know, I still d didn't really like believe in God at that time, but like, I was starting to see God at that time. And that was like my first time really seeing him. And then, uh, you know, I land in Durango and again, with the desperation of a drowning man, because I'm willing to just do it because I have to, and I know that. Like, pretty much the second I got off the plane, I'm making amends, I'm arranging amends, I'm meeting with absolutely everybody under the sun. I felt like Dr. Bob leaving St. Thomas, just running around like a lunatic, making all these amends. And, um, you know, like, all of a sudden people are starting to tell me things like they were proud of me. Or uh, that they saw that I had changed, that something looked different. And I couldn't wrap my head around that. I was like, what do you mean something looks different? What do you mean? Like, they're like, you're calm. For like the first time in your life, you're calm and you're nice. <laughs> and I was like, you, you think I'm nice? <laughs> Got you fooled. Okay. Um, you know, but like I started to clean up the wreckage of my past. And like at that point, I was on fire. And then um, I met with my ex-girlfriend without talking to my sponsor beforehand um, to make amends and, uh, you know, figured that the best way to make that situation right would be to sleep with her. Um, and, uh, you know, that backfired brilliantly in my face. Um, because again, what did I start doing? I bookmarked my program of recovery. I was still showing up in AA and still doing the things I needed to do and trying to put AA first. But I'd gotten into a relationship right on step nine and literally slid a bookmark right into step nine. Even though I sat and I read and I started to work 10 and 11 and 12, my sobriety was bookmarked. I wasn't moving past kind of staying in that limbo of like most of the promises coming true, but still in the promises. Um, and like, once that relationship ended, and it ended at a very funny time, I was, uh, I was getting ready to do my first sponsee's fifth step, and she called me and she told me that she had cheated on me a day before I was supposed to fly out to Colorado to visit her. And um, so I'm sitting there in my self-pity and resentment because that's like what I love. I love just filling up like a bathtub of self-pity and just splashing it in my face, like almost on a daily basis. And so like I'm sitting there and I'm like, <laughs> poor me. And uh, you know, <laughs> I do the thing I'm supposed to do and I call my sponsor. And I'm like, dude, like there's no way I can do this, this guy's fifth step. Like I'm so absorbed in self right now and like I can't give him anything. And he's like, nope, that's exactly what you need to do, so go fucking do it. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and, um, you know, lo and behold, like, 
that exact situation was one of the first things on his resentment list. And I immediately had to take myself out of it and start helping him process this and helping him see his part. And then all of a sudden doing that, I'm seeing my part and I'm working through it and I'm at peace by the end of that fifth step like I've never experienced in my life. And um, that's when the promises came true for me. That's the moment I had that spiritual awakening and realized that God was doing for me what I could not do for myself. Those feelings of uselessness and self-pity had disappeared. And um, like literally in one fell swoop, all the ninth step promises came, through, came true and I fell in love with AA. I fell in love with every single facet of this program and I was in. My sponsor uses this analogy and I use it probably every day. <laughs> and I have to tell myself it every day. Uh, two men are standing in front of the Grand Canyon. And there's this tightrope laid across it. And the first one turns to the second one. And he's like, do you have faith that I can walk across this tightrope? So the guy's like, yeah, absolutely I have faith. You know, I've seen 100 men do it before. It works. And, you know, I totally believe you can walk across this tightrope. He's like, all right, cool. Do you think I can do it with a wheelbarrow? You know, same thing. The second guy's like, yeah, absolutely. I've seen 100 men do it before. You got this. You're good. You can walk across that tightrope with a wheelbarrow. And he's like, all right, cool. Give him the fucking wheelbarrow. And, um, you know, because that's the difference between faith and trust. And that's where I learned to trust infinite God rather than my finite self. It was because, like, you know, I can have faith. I can have faith up, down, left, right, and sideways. But once I get in that wheelbarrow, that's when he meets all calamity with serenity and carries me. And, um, you know, from that day forward, I was just absolutely in love with AA and... You know, was picking up commitments left and right, like trying to sponsor every single person that breathed in the rooms and like <laughs> just wanted to like just do AA. And it wasn't about me anymore. It was I wanted to carry this to anybody I could, anybody I could, you know, just so that they could have that same experience, that same spiritual experience that I had had. And um, You know, I, I then started during that time to learn how to do a really good 10 and 11 and 12. And, you know, you can talk to me after the meeting if you want to talk about that. But I think everybody has their own 10 and 11 and 12 that they kind of do that kind of works with their routine. And as long as you're maintaining that conscious contact and taking inventory at the end of the day, like that's what matters. And like having a few minutes to just sit and be. Um, but so this was back in fall. I'm throwing myself into AA. Uh, you know, just hitting a year and a half sober, and um, my sponsor, Jamie, Brittany, and I decided we wanted to start a Saturday night meeting um, up in Wilmington, where the Trolley Square Lit Review is, and uh, or literature meeting. I don't know why I always say lit review. It's probably because I'm a fucking academic and that's just... <laughs> I always say that and I always just catch myself and I'm like, that's not the name of your home group, dude. Like... <laughs> but, so, we decided we wanted to start a, a Saturday night meeting and, you know, the group conscience starts to form and um, it's still, still my favorite meeting to go to every week. And, uh, You know, in light of recent events, I didn't know, like, how quickly I'd get through my own story and talking about myself and how quickly I'd get up to this point. Um, and so I feel with the time I have left to share, it's important to share as much of this story as I can and talk about the last nine months of my life. Because in that nine months, I've learned more about sobriety and how to be a man in sobriety and what emotional sobriety means than I ever thought I could possibly learn. And the beauty of it is, is every time I talk to my sponsor, almost every day we say, or he tells me there's still more work to do, and I say always. Because there's always more work to do. There's always more lessons to be learned. And you never know how those lessons are going to come to you or what person is going to bring you those lessons. And... Uh, In putting AA first, showing up and doing the things I needed to do, thank you, and uh, opportunities to be of service in creating that meeting, started to form a connection with Jamie Hood. 
You know, for those of you who know her, you knew her. <laughs> and uh, for those of you in here that don't, she was the speaker finder for this meeting. Um, she was a home group member. She sponsored women, and she worked an amazing program, and she passed last Monday as a result of this disease. And uh, so actually, like at this meeting, was where I first got her number. <laughs> Wearing this outfit. <laughs> and uh, and um, you know, you never know what lessons God is gonna teach you or how he's gonna show up. And I still had a lot of living amends that I had left to make through a lot of things in my life that I didn't know how I was gonna make right and all of a sudden I had the opportunity to. I had the opportunity to show up as, as a man of integrity, grace and dignity in a relationship and demonstrate that as a man of sobriety. I remember hearing a speaker tape with Peter M and he said, you really want to test where your serenity and sobriety and spiritual program is at, get, on the relation, get in a relationship or get on I-95. <laughs> and um, you know, for me the I-95 thing wasn't working too well so maybe I'd get in a relationship. And, um, you know, it was funny because it came at a point in my life where I wasn't seeking a relationship anymore. And it's funny how that happens, you know? Like, I had a relationship with God and the men in this room, and that's all I really needed. And uh, some of my closest friends, we always joked because I always said, like, I would never speak to a woman in AA. Um, <laughs> like, I, I was terrified of all of you, and, uh, <laughs> you know, I wasn't going to do it, and then... Here it happens, and I remember talking with my, and I remember talking with my sponsor, and um, talking with my sponsor, and you know, he uses that fucking wheelbarrow analogy, and he's like, "Do you trust AA?" Get in the wheelbarrow. From that point, I just did, and um, you know, I've gotten a lot of gifts in sobriety, a lot of stupid material shit that doesn't absolutely matter at all. Um, and like, it's really easy because of that for me to get consumed in the life that sobriety has given me. Um, you know, I'm a grad student, like I said, and it's really easy for me to lose sight of where I am at and get consumed by that. It's even easier for me looking at my track record to get into relationships and get consumed by that. And uh, you know, there's that, we always say like, we have to put AA first. You know, and why is that? Because, like, as great as the relationship is, if I don't put AA first, I'm going to lose her. As great as the job is, if I don't put AA first, I'm going to lose that job. You know, as great as everything else that I have as a result of God showing up in my life and doing for me what I couldn't do for myself, like, if I lose sight of that, I'm fucked. You know, because I'm going to pick up. And, like... With my track record and the progression of this disease, the chances of me surviving the next time I pick up are slim to none. And I know that today more than ever. And, um, you know, they, they always say, like, you know, you have to stay grateful, right? You have to stay grateful for the gifts you have and the things in your life and the sobriety you're working. And uh, two weeks ago, outside of this meeting, I'm standing there talking with two of my sponsees and my sponsor, and... Jamie, and uh, she gives me the suggestion of starting a gratitude list with them. So I do it. And uh, that gratitude list saved my life every single day the last nine days. And, um, you know, the reason that is is because if I'm grateful first thing when I wake up in the morning and I look at everything that I have to be grateful for, I cannot deny how God is continuously showing up in my life. And if I cannot deny how God is continuously showing up in my life, then I have no other option but to keep him close. Even when I don't want to, even when I want to just sit there and scream at him and tell him to go fuck himself, I have no other option because he continuously gives me gifts. Even in my hardest moments, he shows up. Even when I don't want him to be there, he's there. And, um, you know, so continuously practice gratitude, whether you're in your first 24 hours or you've been in here for 24 years. Practice gratitude for the fact that you're breathing today. Because for almost every single person in this room, that shouldn't have been an option, and we're all on borrowed time. You know, we're all on borrowed time. And, uh, you know, having that is just one of the greatest gifts. 
and how fucking dare I get consumed in those gifts and not reach my hand out to help another man achieve them. Um, so, the last nine months of my life. Um, <laughs> I remember walking into this relationship full of fear and uh, full of fear that I was going to show up. You know, same with like every time I come to the podium, full of fear that I'm going to show up. And I was outside of Green Hill and I was talking to my buddy Tim about this, just in passing. And um, he said the most fucking profound words to me. He's like, why don't you just treat every woman like you would want your mother or your sister to be treated and walk the way. And I said that in my head almost every single day. Um, and I stopped looking at the relationship of what I could get from it or anything like that, but rather what I could bring to it, you know? It wasn't about me, it was about being of service. Uh, the first night Jamie and I went on a drive after this meeting, uh, we were supposed to like go hang out like right after the meeting, but there was a newcomer, so I went and I helped him and met up with her four hours later, because AA always comes first. Um, you know, we started talking and, you know, we set boundaries right away that are still kind of guiding forces to my life. Like AA always comes first, period. Period, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. When AA calls, I am there. Regardless of what I have to do or what I think I need to do or where I want to be or what I want to do, I'm there, period. If AA doesn't inconvenience your life in some way, shape, or form, then you're not doing it right. Um, and like, it inconveniences my life on a daily fucking basis and I'm more than okay with that. Like, thank you. And, um, you know, thank you all for the 3 a.m. phone calls because they keep me alive today. And, um, you know, so AA always comes first, period. We weren't going to bring AA, or we weren't going to bring our relationship into AA, but we'd bring AA into our relationship. Never once sat next to each other in a meeting. Barely ever talked, like, outside of the meeting except in passing to figure out what we were doing next. And, um, you know, we made sure to keep our programs separate and not sponsor each other. Which, like, trust me, being in a relationship with somebody in the rooms is really fucking hard. Because, like, I want to take your inventory so I don't have to take mine. Because that'd be great. Because, like, last thing I want to do is look at myself and my side of the street, right? Because, like, I think I'm this spiritual rock star that's got it. And, like, no, not at all. I'm still sick as shit every day. And, um... You know, so, like... The number one thing I learned from that relationship... And I think is one of the things that like many of us need to learn in the rooms that's really hard to do is this idea of balance. Um, you know, balancing school, work, job, relationship, AA, family life, social life, having fun, you know, and um, again, it was like middle of the semester, I'm freaking out, or no, it was like near the end of the semester, I'm freaking out, I have like three sponsees coming up on their fifth step. And uh, my final is approaching right around the corner, and I'm on the phone with my sponsor, and I'm just like, dude, like, I either have to drop out of AA or drop out of grad school. Like, there's no other option. Either that or, like, I'm also going to be single in the mix, and this is just not, this isn't going to work out too well. Like, it's all falling to shit. And he's like, why don't you just put God first and AA first and we'll make the time? Like, how big's your God? How big's your God? And, you know, that's a question I have to ask myself every single day, because as long as I keep God bigger than my problems, I'm going to be okay. And um, so I did, you know, I set up the time to work with sponsees, and all of a sudden everything works out, the timing's just fine, you know. And I, I had the hierarchy in my mind of what things were important. I was like AA, the fellowship, relationship, everything else, you know. And, like, it all worked out, and it all balanced, and it's crazy. And so, again, like, when we put AA first, everything falls into place. And, um, you know, in putting AA first, like, I thought I had to be kind of this, like, exemplar of spiritual principles all the time, right? Because it wasn't about me anymore. It's about the newcomer. I continuously have to show up for the newcomer. And, like, how can I show up and, like, give them hope if I'm still sitting here in my sick shit? And so, like, I better not talk about my sick shit. I just better leave it to the side and push it down and suppress it. And when I do that, I'm fucking dead. And, um, you know, because the very first line at the very first step, it says we. 
it's as we, you know, it's not about I, it's not about you, it's us. And like, we're as sick as our secrets and I continuously have to talk about people, about all the sick shit that goes on in my mind. And so like, there's gonna be some sick coming out here in the next few minutes, and I'm okay with that. Um, like I said, the last nine days have been the truest test of my sobriety. Um, as soon as I got the call that Jamie had passed, I uh, drove up to her house and I'm like, this is a fucking joke. This is a joke. It's not real. Pull up into her drive and the cops are out there and it's a joke and I'm going to fucking hit this cop in the face. Because some resentments still run a little too deep. And um, I jump out of the car and uh, I start running forward and my legs give out. And as I'm going down, Nick catches me. And so when I say AA has carried me through the last nine days of my life, I mean from the second AA has literally carried me through the last days of my, last nine days of my life. Every single second, my phone has been ringing. Usually not even people checking in on me, and that's the beautiful part. It's for me to show up and be there for them because I need that. You know, everything we do in here, you know, like it says in the 12 step, practice these principles in all our affairs. We need practice, you know. Anybody who plays football or likes football, you know, you need to review the playbook for when you walk onto that field and the coach calls an audible and you have to move fast or else you're gonna get hit, you're gonna get hit hard and you're gonna be laid the fuck out. But I had it ingrained in me of what I needed to do, even when I didn't want to. I knew to pick up the phone and talk to somebody about whatever was on my mind, even when I didn't want to, free of any fear of judgments. You know, because I knew at the end of the day they'd been there too. You know, I knew that when I didn't want to pray, I had to pray. And I knew that when all I wanted to do is sit there and be in my self-pity and make it about me and poor me, and like, if only you knew what I was going through, you'd understand. I didn't get that opportunity. I had to show up and I had to be of service. I had to walk into these rooms with my head held high and be there for the newcomer, to be there for the person sick and suffering. And like in that, like share the sick thoughts too, you know, share that like, yeah, I'm in it and all I want to do is drink right now. Every morning for the last nine days, the very first thought that's crossed my mind is a drink. Dope was never my twist and that's what took her life and the thought has even crossed my mind of like, why don't you drive up to Kensington and see what her first true love was? And, um, you know, I have to share that stuff. I absolutely have to, because even with almost two and a half years of continuous sobriety, that voice in my ears will still be louder and louder and louder with each day, because it's going to find what it can capitalize and use it. And if I rest on my laurels for a second, I'm dead. I cannot stay sober off of yesterday's sobriety. All I have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual condition. I am never cured. I am never cured. I, if I stop doing the things I know I have to do, that thing will capitalize in the slightest way. And, um, you know, I know when that seed is planted, you can't shake it off, you know. And I know that feeling. I know that feeling well from when after over six years of continuous white knuckled sobriety I picked up. Like I know when it's planted there's no no stopping it. And so before I let that seed grip the soil, I have to talk with somebody so they can help me find that seed and pull it out and help me give it to God. Because he's the only one that can do it for me nowadays. And um you know, so with that if you continue to talk to another alcoholic about all your problems everything that's going on in your mind, if you continue to pray even when you don't want to pray, and you continue to look for opportunities to be of service and show up for the next person in the rooms, you have a chance. You have a chance, as long as we do that every single day. And, uh, you know, just for today, that's why I'm here, and that's what I can't thank you guys enough for the opportunity to come be of service, because it's not about me. This shit keeps me sober, but it's not about me. So thank you for letting me share.